welcome to another of our video series on youth work during coronavirus. Um, this is where we speak to some of our local youth and community workers about the impact of COVID-19 on their practice um, and how they're maintaining contact with young people that they work with at this time. My name is Paulette Sawyers, I am the Joint Programme Leader and a Senior Lecturer on the BA Honours Youth and Community Work degree at Newman University. Um, Today, I'm talking to um, a friend and colleague, um, Leroy McConnell, who works for an organisation called Pauls Birmingham. Um, Leroy, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Pauls and what you do? Okay, um, as Paul has just mentioned, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Leroy McConnell. Um, my role is I'm the youth work uh, manager and participation lead at PAUSE in Birmingham. PAUSE is a seven day a week drop-in service for anybody under the age of 25 who may be experiencing an emotional health or well-being issue. Um, and it is staffed by youth workers, um, therapists, counsellors, mental health trained staff and volunteers. Brilliant. So it's quite an innovative way, um, and I know you were quite central to the to the idea and the inception of how that amalgamation of different workers would come together in a different space. Mm. Um, so it's quite an innovative way of looking at mental health by bringing together um, the professional kind of clinical support as well as the um, the youth work support which is around relationship building and around choice and, and that empowerment and just kind of encouraging young people when they walk through the door that everything's okay mm -hmm. um so um so i think it's i think it is a novel project and i think it's we've had visitors who've come to newman who've come to visit your project and been really mm -hmm. impressed with the way that you've merged the two working styles and how it works really well for young people mm -hmm. um so we're in this weird situation of COVID-19. Um, and as a result, as you know, all of us are in quarantine, self-isolation, lockdown, all these other words people use for it. Um, and that no doubt that's gonna have an impact on the work that you can do with young people because your services are dropping. Mm -hmm. um, I know you might be aware that the NYA recently launched their report, the Out of Sight Vulnerable Young People Report. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a response to them looking at the impact on young people um, because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. One of their three top concerns, which it directly speaks to your work, is around mm -hmm. their concern of the increased mental health um, issues and challenges for young people. And they kind of estimate that probably around a million young people Mm -hmm. as a result of this situation are going to probably need more additional support around their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me some of your thoughts about that in terms of what the NYA have said, but also some of the challenges that PAUSE themselves have found and encountered and some of the ways that you've overcome some of the challenges to still work with young people? Okay. Sounds like a three-pronged question that yeah. does. <laughs> okay, so in response to the, 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 the report, um, I think one of the, my views is with any kind of big event, there's always an emotional impact, um, positive or negative. And in our case, we've got a pandemic that initially when we heard about it in maybe December in the distance, it was something that happens over there. Mm -hmm. Those people over there are going to be affected. So I don't need to worry. And I think as it crept closer and closer to the British Isles and became a, a thing. And it, you know, we had a lot of um, propaganda on, the, on social media. A lot of young people were consuming this information right. around about December and tracked it right up until March. And you know, with young people, they're quite savvy and they will start cross-examining information and start questioning motivations. And I, I picked up on some of this in the early part of the year when young people were getting a bit worried about it. Mm -hmm. and you know, as a result, you kind of say, look at the government guidelines, da -da 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 -da, all that kind of stuff. Now, that, that does, doesn't always answer how they feel. What it does, it means it changes their behaviour into what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. I think in terms of us knowing that there has to be an impact, we know that this is quite a traumatic experience for everybody. And I think 
with young people, trauma doesn't really show itself until later on, it doesn't show itself immediately. As with adults, it shows itself later on. And my feeling with response to the report is it's a time bomb waiting to happen, you know, so we're not, we're not going to see the, the impact now in terms of April 2020. We're probably going to see a delayed impact, so where young people are not going to really present for at least three to nine months time, because if you look at the timeline of um, the idea of lockdown getting released, everyone's speculating mm. various dates. Um, if you kind of look at how schools are functioning, many schools aren't considering returning until September. Yeah. So there's going to be worry and panic yeah. happening in here. And it's going to be happening with the adults, happening with the children. Um, it's going to manifest itself a little bit deeper within children because they're still forming their views. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to understand where their position is in the world, who can support them, where they can get the support from. So, you know, the, the, the report's pretty accurate and it might actually be an underestimate in my view because, you know, are we talking about, I didn't look at the report details, but are we talking children up to the age of 18 or are we going up to 25? in terms of some cases so that's a question that mm -hmm. we might need to consider so in terms of um the report yeah it's, it's, a, it's a timely report our organization at the children's society who pause is is connected to are already looking at the impact across the nation around how it affects young people we're doing some of this work as well so it is quite scary it's an under i feel it's an underestimate there's going to be a massive um, ripple effect whether it be um, young people not wanting to attend school young people not wanting to go to youth clubs young mm -hmm. people not wanting to see their friends um, that's that concerns me massively um, I think the second part of your question was about how we are pivoting or adjusting to meet that yeah need. yeah so um, how, what are some of the challenges paused specifically yeah. faith and how have you overcome some of them Okay, so as, as you've mentioned, pause is a dropping service. Dropping means you arrive. <laughs> um, we don't have that building at the moment with, in line with the government guidance. And so what pause has had to do is take a face-to-face -face service, like standard youth work or standard shop work, and put it into a format that feels very um, clunky, feels very awkward. Um, but at the same time, it's done with a team of people who want to continue to provide support in a particular kind of way. And, you know, as a team, we've managed to create a telephone service within two weeks and get it marketed within three weeks. Okay. That means we've had to get equipment out to staff. We've had to train staff. We've had to put an online process in place. We've had to put a triage in place. We've had to put a lot of aspects of keeping safe practice really tight around, not only just working with children and young people, but working with children and young people who may be considered vulnerable and have multiple um, So um, in a nutshell, it's been really hard, mm -hmm. um, but it's been hard because we don't know whether young people are going to come to us. That's another bit that's hard because we already know a lot of young people find it difficult to present um, at a doctor's, at another professional to talk for maybe the first time about their mental health. That's what PAUSE is, is, is designed for. Um, and what, we, what we've had to do is almost market ourselves completely differently. It's a completely different service. Um, you know, it's a service that involves a callback, it involves a triage, it involves um, a member of staff listening in whilst one staff member has a conversation. So we're having to work completely differently. And this excites me because what it does, it makes our team have to think and operate differently, right. but doesn't take away the care and compassion, the listening, the empathy that we do when we're face to face. So when we think about telephone helplines, generally telephone helplines are a listening service or a crisis service. What we've had to configure is how do we do a coaching service? How do we do a mentoring service? How do we do an empathic listening service? How do we do a service that challenges young people's thinking? 
all within 30 minutes on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in a nutshell, it's been really, really challenging. We haven't as yet seen the, the rush of numbers that we predicted. But as our comms only went out two weeks ago, it's filtering out throughout um, Birmingham and we're starting to see um, young people present more and more now. Um, so at times like pause have met the challenge head on really and you haven't been faced by the fact that circumstances have changed and that your need to interact with young people has also got to change to reflect that yes it's brilliant it is brilliant um so we are in an uncertain time as you've highlighted and you've kind of really eloquently kind of laid out in a multitude of ways that we are in a different phase and, and everybody's got to kind of react and respond differently. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you um, some of your thoughts. When we come out of this, and I know people talk about us coming out of this, when we're in our new normal, whatever that looks like, what are, your, some, of, what are some of your thoughts around the role of youth and community workers in helping and supporting young people to readjust from being in a situation of quarantine and, and isolation and moving back into a society that is socialising again? Um, That's a big question. It's a big question because it's kind of like, as adults, we're going to have to learn how to do it and we're going to have to pro-social role model to young people how to do it well. And, you know, there's no better um, profession to do that other than youth and community in play because the reality is... Um, we are we're interwoven within communities and we need to demonstrate how to do things well. I think the fear will be if us as workers or professionals don't do this well or do it in a particular way, young people will be confused. Um, so I think there has to be some level of consistency around how professionals, young people professionals, do this around young people to present a way of doing things in a professional way. So for example, you know, just as we provide informal education around, I don't know, um, sex and alcohol, sex and drugs, um, we need to do that in a very similar way to, well, is it a good idea that you have contact with all those people and you don't know where they're from and we're still in this early phase? So we're gonna have to keep challenging young people because, you know, at the moment in the media, um, there's a lot of information about young people gathering in places and you know that's because of frustration that's because of I want to see my mates and that's because of you know I'm bored I haven't probably been given the right amount of information and there's my parents are saying there's conflict in government information my friends show me this on social media so young people are just going to vote with their feet and go out and see their mates mm -hmm. and we've got to be able to give them the confidence to make their own decisions, not necessarily follow the herd and be really thoughtful about what they're doing for their environment and their families. So I think the slowing down of the release or the um, reducing issues around lockdown has to be done in a very measured way. Um, so for example, you know, I know with us at pause, we will have to open and we're already looking at risk assessments about when we open, what are the procedures we have to put into place? Mm -hmm. How many people can we really have in the building? Mm -hmm. How many staff can actually be in the staff room? How long is this going to last for? Is it going to be a two month period, three month, you know, and all of those discussions we're having about the back office action of how we work with young people, we have to have it about the, the front of house as well. Um, and I think, you know, young people are scared. You know, a lot of young people I've spoken to on the phones and parents are scared because these um, restrictions, when they do get lifted, some people are going to flaunt the lifting of them. Some people are going to embrace it and be very cautious. And a lot of young people are going to go, well, I don't know which way to go. Help me, help navigate me, help steer me in the right direction. And I think that's when it's going to get really, really tricky because the unsureties, the mixed messages are going to increase. Um, we are going to see another spike in this issue. And we are going to be speaking to lots of friends and lots of young people and lots of family about death. And, you know, I think it's about as as 
youth and community workers, we've got to really think about how we have these conversations mm -hmm. around death with young people and how to um, care for them whilst having these conversations because they are going to be triggering for us as adults. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this will probably be the first time us as professionals will have experienced um, the raft of deaths that are so many that we're aware of and be able to still be professional around young people when they're talking about their family members death. So these, these are conversations that are going to be pretty new to our, our field. We do talk about death with young people, but we're not going to be talking. We've never really talked about it in this capacity before. You know, I spoke to a youth worker yesterday and he knows of 23 people who have died. Wow. You know, that's, that's a lot of people. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I know quite a few people who have died. I think my number's are around about eight. And it's kind of like when you have that conversation with people, they kind of go, oh, I thought it was just on the news. I thought it was just, and it's no, no, this is real. There's something happening. It's real. Whatever it is, it's real. And it's about being able to be grounded in having those conversations of reality with young people. And as professionals, we need to do that really well and vanguard it well. Yeah, brilliant. And I think... I think you've highlighted there some of the some of the skills around youth workers mm. in terms of that conversation and having a dialogue with young people and being with them at the at the point that they are and mm. not mm. rushing them mm. to another point. Just just being with them in that space and if that space is confusion, then that's okay. Let's yeah. see this confusion and work out together where we move forward from this confusion. Yeah. If that is about fear, if it's about anxiety, whichever it is, mm -hmm. the skill of the youth worker and the patience and the understanding and that mm -hmm. navigation and that 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 choice that we mm -hmm. that, that young people are given in the relationship that youth and community workers build with them, the choice mm -hmm. to engage or not, the choice to be who you are mm -hmm. is going to be of paramount importance I think as a result mm -hmm. of this situation yeah. um, it's going to take time and I think you've highlighted there really well that actually youth and community workers are trained to invest that time yes. we, you know we aren't trained to expect immediate results it takes time it's about longevity it's about the journey rather mm. than the destination mm -hmm. and so I think all of that is encompassed in your thoughts about what's going to be put in place to support not only the staff but also the young people when Paul's moved back to a front face-to-face -to -face frontline service provision, but also for youth and community work practitioners more broadly. Mm -hmm. And that actually youth and community work practitioners need to draw on their support networks mm -hmm. to enable them to deal with the enormity of this pandemic, its mm -hmm. impacts and how it affects them as a worker and to be mm -hmm. the best worker for the young people. They mm -hmm. also need to have their supervisory support as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Leroy, for no interrupting your day and having a chat with me about the, the important work that um, Paws are doing, particularly around mental health, um, and for the continued support that Paws are doing, and for the, the swift turnaround from the doors being closed to your teams being able to still provide the support that the young people urgently need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. No if you're watching this video and you'd like to know more about the youth and community work degree at Newman University, please click the link in the description box below. And also, if you're interested in more information about PAUSE, its services, what it does and how it works with young people, or if you'd like to volunteer, please click the link in the description box. Also, thanks for watching.